Yo, and welcome back to the Stop the Violence podcast. It's already episode five, and today I have my boyfriend Keegan with me again, and we're both going to talk about how we both used to be animal abusers. Everyone before they're a vegan used to be an animal abuser to different varying degrees, and we each have our own stories. We are not these innocent angels that were just born straight out the womb vegan animal rights activists. We have some shady, dark pasts going on here. Um, But yeah. Before we get into the conversation, I just want to talk about a couple of things. And first and foremost is Veganuary. So Happy New Year. It's January 2021 now and Veganuary is going on. And it's not too late. You can sign up all month long at veganuary.com and I'll put it in the show notes. And it's basically just completely free help and information about going vegan, what to buy at the store, how to eat at restaurants, all the good stuff, Um, and it's completely free. So sign up for that. What better, more important of a New Year's resolution could there be than deciding to stop hurting animals? And the other thing was that I just moved. Um, My mom and I moved into a little house it's it's a lot nicer, it's quieter, and I just wanted to mention something that happened during our move. So when we were transporting my cat, his name is Shitten, when we were transporting him in a cage, he's never really been out of the house very much at all, and he hates going out of the house. And so he was panicking, he was like crying, he was breathing really fast, he was panting, and it was it made me really sad i wanted to just help him i felt so sad for him and i was petting him through the holes in the cage and then when i was sitting there doing that during the drive and it was only like a 30 minute drive but i was like wow this reminds me kind of of like vigils where we visit slaughterhouses and bear witness to the animals because we're trying to pet animals and comfort them through little holes as they're on the truck. And I'm I'm sitting here thinking like, well, I know that my cat's going to be safe. We're just going to arrive at a new home and he might be a little bit scared for a day or two, but he's going to be totally fine. And that's not the case for all these animals that are sitting on trucks. And the drive's a lot more than 30 minutes. So if my cat was that scared, even though his companion human, me, was there comforting him and talking to him, and he was still that scared, you just have to imagine how scared the animals on the slaughter trucks are. Like, cats and dogs show their emotions so much, and you can't help but wonder if there were cats and dogs on the trucks, would people start to care? And you'd be surprised how similarly cattle and pigs and sheep show those same exact emotions that our pets do. Okay, and now we're moving on to the episode. So the reason we're talking about our past as previous animal abusers is we want to really stress the point that anyone can go vegan and even furthermore, anyone can become a vegan animal rights activist. We have ex-slaughter workers that go vegan and become activists. We have ex-truck drivers, ex-farmers that convert their farms to sanctuaries or convert to plant farming or that become animal rights activists. So it's not limited. There's not any particular way that you have to be, any place you have to be from or any way that you have to be raised in order to speak up for animals and definitely not in order to become vegan through just your lifestyle. So first, here is Keegan, and he's going to talk about his past. He used to do a bit of fishing, so here you go. What's up, everybody? Um, So yeah, like we said, um, we're just trying to relate to everybody. Um, Nobody was born vegan, um, and it's pretty easy to make the switch, especially when everything in the store is available to you. Um, So getting into my story, um, growing up, uh, I had an uncle, have an uncle, uh, an aunt who fish a lot. Um, they have two boats, one for salt water, one for fresh water, and they take multiple vacations every year to go fishing. Um, and they really enjoy being out on the boat, enjoying the nature. 
Um, so, you know, as a kid, they started bringing us along. And uh, we used to go um, to places in Pennsylvania where I'm from. And then we also used to drive about, I think, nine or ten hours north up into Canada um, and go to this lake um, called Constance Lake. Um, and we'd stay there for a week uh, at a time and fish a lot. Every day we'd go fishing in the morning, usually, or at night, whatever one we wanted to. But in the morning, the fish were biting more, so that's when we went. Um, but yeah, to give you an old idea, uh, it was pretty much a way for me to, you know, bond with my uncle, bond with my aunt, and enjoy the nature. Uh, you know, you think that you're out there enjoying the nature, but really what you're doing is pretty horrific. Um, I like to I like to use the example of relating fishing to taking your dog, if everybody has a dog or a cat, um, you know, we're land animals and fish are in the water. So let's take the opposite scenario and apply that to a dog. If we take a dog and we, you know, hook its mouth and then drown it in water for a little bit and then take it out again, that's basically what we're doing with fishing. You know, we're throwing a hook into the water with a bait, hoping, you know, that this fish will bite and that it'll somehow give us a little bit of pleasure and enjoyment out of this, which is pretty messed up if you think about it. I mean, we're pulling this fish out of their environment, they're suffocating, you know, and then we're putting them back if it's catch and release. Um, a lot of the fishing that we did um, was actually not catch and release. I mean, we would eat the fish. Um, and that's a whole nother story, just watching the fish being butchered and my, my uncle would literally take a pole and basically just smack the fish once. He was pretty good at it, he would just hit it once and that would be it. But it would flap around a lot and you could tell that it definitely was not an enjoyable experience. Yeah, I've seen, like, because I've been camping and I've never fished myself. I've thrown out a line but I've never caught a fish myself, I don't think. And, but I've seen, like, my dad or my uncle, the way they used to kill the fish was they would blunt force trauma, smack their face on the rock, and I think they'd have to do it more than once. And that was just horrible to watch. Yeah, I mean, that just, you know, it, my uncle was thinking that he was doing, you know, the fish a favor by just giving it one good blunt trauma to the head. But, you know, what he could have been doing is just riding around in his boat and not catching fish and doing the exact same thing. Uh, so I just want everybody to realize that, I mean, you know, whether you're a fisherman or a, or a hunter, there's always a way to, you know, make the transition to a more compassionate life, um, a compassionate lifestyle, ergo veganism. Um, but so that's enough for the actual, you know, story about what I used to do. Um, but we kind of want to get into a little bit um, more about facts about fish and then kind of just give you a reference um, for a YouTube video that you can check out. Okay, but before we get to that, Keegan, do you have any stories or memories from fishing where you really felt bad for the fish or you saw some suffering that was happening? Uh, yeah, I think one actually comes to mind. Uh, so there's a species of fish, uh, freshwater fish. That's what all the, all the fishing, not all the fishing, but all the fishing I did with my uncle um, was freshwater fishing. And the one species of fish was called a rock bass. Um, now there's multiple different species of bass, um, small mouth, large mouth, and a bunch of other ones. But so the rock bass, um, the thing that was interesting about them is if you did this really weird thing to them, they would get all woozy. So what you would do is we would take the fish after we caught them and you'd basically give them a flip into the water, basically like spin them in the air, make them like an acrobat and land into the water. And what would happen is right when they hit the water, they would be all woozy as if they were like drunk or like out of it. Aww. And it was just really, I mean, looking back, like when I was in it, I was like, this They're is hilarious. just dizzy, I mean. No, I know, but it was no other fish would do oh. it. No other species of fish would do this, which is just really interesting. I don't know how my uncle figured this out. I don't know. But uh, that's how we, and I, now looking back, it's like, Jesus, like we literally were flipping this fish out and then basically laughing at them, yeah. you know, and not to mention putting the hook in their mouth and pulling them out of the water and making them suffocate. Um, so that was just one thing that really stuck out to me. That was just, 
looking back is just barbaric. Yeah, I mean, I have plenty of instances. I mean, in the family that I grew up in, I just remembered that there would be maggots in the barnyard. And when I was a kid, my brother, who's older, of course, you always look up to your siblings, like he would spray them with WD-40 and then light them on fire. And then to us, it was like, oh, so hilarious. Like maggots are disgusting. Let's burn those bitches. And, but like, they still feel pain. They still suffer. And that was unnecessary. And that was really mean. And it's just ridiculous that there are families out there that teach their kids like, oh, it's hilarious to laugh at the suffering of other creatures. Yeah, imagine taking that situation and burning a dog or a cat. I don't think everybody would be too happy about that. Yeah, and that What's does happen in the world. Of but course. yeah, there shouldn't be a difference. And I know my dad, a lot of the times, he thought it was hilarious, just hilarious, to make dogs chase cats in the house. Like, my grandma had these papillons, so they're a small dog, and she had, like, three or four of them at a time always, and then she had this cat, who was only seven years old, I'm pretty sure, but he was overweight, but my dad was making the small dogs chase the cat all around this one time, until the cat, like, literally dropped and died. I don't know if he had a heart attack or what happened, but it was like really, cause I was still a kid. I was maybe around 12 or so. And my cousin and I were like sobbing and we had to sleep on the floor in grandma's room that night cause we were so upset. Um, and it was just, it was just really terrible. And I don't know, my dad kind of has this history of being mean to cats like that. I know that when we moved this one time when I was very young, I was like three, he, uh, I don't know exactly the story, but I'm almost certain that he took the cats that we had at the time since we were moving states and just released them at my grandma's house. And she lives in the country, lived in the country in Colorado and just like let him out. And they most likely got eaten by like a coyote or something like that. And yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like what she's talking about chasing, you know, having a dog chase a cat around. I mean, it's pretty similar to what they do in rodeos and right. other things. I mean, you have, I mean, I'm sure Lisa can touch on this stuff more, but I mean, you have, you know, I'm pretty sure there's an event where they have a guy riding a horse and they have to rope down a baby calf and then yeah. tie him up real quick. There's calf roping, there's okay. steer wrestling, um, things like that. There's also cutting... Um, yeah, so calf roping is basically you're riding a horse and you, you rope the rope and then you get it like on around their neck and, um. Meanwhile, this air animal is completely ter terrified. Yeah. I mean, if you ever look any of this stuff up, it's, they're not very happy. They, they let them out and they want to get the, the hell out of there. <laughs> yeah, and they're little babies too. And they, they pull them backwards. They yank them. The horse is trained, um, that once uh the rider jumps off to back up to walk backwards so that he's pulling the rope so it gets tighter on the cat wow they train them to do that That's yeah crazy. and then yeah so you're training animals to help abuse other, other animals. animals while like the animals are also wearing a bunch of skins of other dead animals it's like it's so weird while you're also like eating a hot dog and it's just the cycle of abuse never rodeos ends. that are so much abuse it's actually insane like <laughs> And, and same with horse racing and stuff. And I used to support both of those things and be part of them. And I'll get to that in a minute. But yeah, and then they go up and tie three of their legs together. And then there's also steer wrestling where you jump off and you grab like their horns and flip them upside down. And you just put like, Yank their neck. I think you just put their head. I know I was never too interested. I used to be a barrel yeah. racer, but you just like flip them to where their head and their backs on the ground a certain way and that's how you stop the clock and then cutting is not part of rodeo but cutting is basically where you're riding a horse and you're separating like one cow from a herd of another or yeah one cow out of the herd of a bunch of cows you're separating them and that cow is trying to run back to the rest of the herd but you're on the horse like blocking them and um 
like going side to side blocking them from trying to get back to the herd and it's also really hard on the horse's joints because they're constantly really low to the ground and pivoting and the saddle for that is usually really heavy and the horses for that are usually shorter and smaller so it's just oh there's endless abuse in horse disciplines before i get more into my side of the ex-animal abuser story um here's keegan again on the fish yeah so i just uh me personally i don't want to sit here and talk about all the fish facts because i personally don't know as much as i should about this stuff um currently gonna get into it more um start doing some more research but for you guys out there listening i wanted to give you guys a couple resources that you could use to learn about this stuff you know fish feel pain fish can actually recognize um their companion animals um faces which is pretty crazy if you think about um nobody would think that a fish in a fish tank could literally recognize their mm-hmm. their companion animal when they come home to the greet companion them companion human yeah companion human exactly and so what i what i wanted to reference you guys and point you to is a short little video well it's not too short it's about an hour documentary um it's called what a fish knows um and it's it's by this guy named jonathan balcombe um it was actually at this conference um in hawaii i think back in 2016 but he actually wrote a book called what a fish knows um and then so that's a good one to check out and then there's actually a more recent video um on earthling ed's podcast the disclosure podcast if you guys um, have heard of him. I'm sure Alicia has mentioned him many times before. Um, the episode is number 26 and it's called Why Don't Humans Care About Fish? And it's with the same guy, Jonathan Balcombe. Uh, we were actually listening to that on our road trip and we found it very informative. So what about catch and release? Because I know I have n- non-vegan uncle and aunt who say, oh, we f- we fish, but don't worry to me and my mom don't worry it's catch and release it doesn't hurt them like does catch and release really not hurt the fish well it depends i mean obviously you look at it from the the animal's point of view and hell no of course not of course it's just as cruel as eating them yeah. um you know if you one would argue it might even be more cruel um lesser of two evils obviously they're both still evil but the way i would look at it is you know not only are these fish going through this terrorizing, you know, event, but they're put back into this lake and then it might happen again, you know? And I've actually, I've actually seen and caught fish um, and, and seen them with literal gaps and, and gashes in their lips. Um, so for the people out there that say that fish don't feel pain, oh, they're, it's just cartilage, like blah, blah, blah. Like it's complete, it's complete utter, I don't even want to say bullshit, but that's what it is. Um, um, because clearly these animals are going through pain if they have to have an open sore like that. Right. Um, and I'm sure it maybe it heals over a little bit, but they literally have part of their mouth missing. Yeah. And some of them actually swallow the hook. Imagine that. Really? Oh yeah. Holy I've had fuck. I've had some I've had some caught in some fish where my uncle was like, oh well, I can't get it out. So they just cut the line and they just throw it back in. Oh my god! Yeah. So That's imagine so that. That's so sad. That's yeah. kind of a similar idea to when hunters shoot down and kill, or even just injure, but kill a deer, an elk, or something. But then they can't find. Apparently, they can't find the body, so they can't even like take the body to do it. So it's literally. I mean, it's always for no reason, but then it's literally for no reason that you killed the animal. So the other thing about catch and release is that when you put them back in the water, it's not like they're just like, oh, that was interesting. And they go back along with their day. Like, no, they're, it was traumatic. It was shocking and they can be in shock. And um, yeah, go to what a fish knows in that video, which is on YouTube um, for more information about that. We know that most of the reason, if not pretty much all of the reason that people and it's usually men, um, do hunt or fish is because it's such a positive memory for them of bonding with dad or grandpa, and they're, they have an emotional attachment to it because of that, and going out in nature and camping and 
being on the boat and water and all of that stuff, but like you can do all of these things and enjoy nature without the animal abuse aspect of it. I mean, we were just on a road trip where we were camping all the time and we still enjoyed the nature just as much without the violence. And Plus, it's a lot cheaper. Oh my God, <laughs> You don't have yeah. to buy bullets, you don't have to buy fishing rods. You know how expensive fishing rods are? Some of my uncle's fishing rods were $700. Oh, so, that's such a waste. You know, oh, he he makes his own lures and everything. He's really into it. Well, but. that's just the same as, like, saddles and exactly. tack for horses. Like, they can be thousands of dollars for a saddle. Yeah. So I do genuinely have some amount of compassion and understanding for hunters and fishermen. And maybe they just haven't thought about it. And maybe they just haven't had this conversation about animal rights and you know, the fact that they don't need to do it and that they can have fun and bond in a different way. But there's still not an excuse. Like, I, my compassion for it only goes so far because I gave up something that I was very emotionally invested in that was for 10 whole years of my life, which is almost half of my whole existence on planet Earth, I was completely, my life was pretty much revolved around horse riding and the horse industry and horse related sports and activities and I still was able to quit that and just find new hobbies like I I focus my time more on music now and art and making videos and so I don't have a lot of like patience and I don't make excuses for these people because I made the switch and it was very entwined in my life probably a lot more than like hunters or fishermen because that kind of stuff is only seasonal So, and I was, I had horse involvement every weekend, like, and then every day in the summer and stuff when I was in school. I'm going to point you right to my friend Jamie Logan's podcast, Under the Vegfluence, right now. And you can either listen to it now and come back, or I would recommend listening to it after you finish this episode. Um, But she had me as a guest on there, and... It's going to be an episode that's coming out today, um, which would be the day before this one comes out. And I talk pretty in depth with her about some of the horrific stories of animal abuse that just I was involved with and my family was involved with through horses and rodeo. And so, yeah, please do go listen to that one. I think it'll be a really good episode. I'll have that linked in the show notes as well. But yeah, I grew up riding horses, and I'll just run down like a a short version of the story. Um, but I I moved with my dad when I was ten in Colorado. I was with my mom before that, and basically, I had like grandparents and aunts that had horse property. Like they had a barn, they had a like four and a half acres. And they had horses all the time as I was growing up. And I had this cousin that was really into horse riding, and she still is. We're not currently talking. And, you know, I love her, but I don't love the fact that she's still doing what she's doing. But um, she's really into barrel racing. And so we grew up together kind of like sisters. And we started riding horses as really young kids. And we didn't really have a lot of adult supervision or professional guidance or we didn't have any riding lessons we didn't have even really trained horses especially me so I got a horse for free when I was 12 years old and he was completely not trained so when I got him every time I got on him he bucked me off literally and it hurt a lot (laughs) And I should have just gave up and stopped then, but I was stubborn and I wanted to prove a point. I wanted to prove myself. Like, my family was really negative and I knew that if I could, like, prove myself through horse-related accomplishments that they would praise me and be positive toward me. And I was so desperate for that. That was your pretty much your 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 way of acceptance from your... From your yeah, family. it was, like, the only way besides getting good grades that... I could take a break from their harshness, I guess. And and my cousin and I were quite competitive with each other. And um, she had a horse too, and we would ride together. And we'd do a lot of stupid, just 
uneducated stuff because we didn't have any adult supervision with the horses. We would watch horse training shows and videos from the RFD TV channel on TV and from YouTube, from like Clinton Anderson and Pat Pirelli and horse trainers like that. And we'd try our best to kind of mimic what they were doing. And and then we had like my aunts and our family members telling us basically to just beat the shit out of horses when they were acting bad and don't let them have their way. And you'll you'll hear more about that in depth and uh, the Under the Vegfluence podcast, but um, we used whips, we used spurs, we, you know, went to horse racing at, uh, I don't I think it was a Rapaho, it was called a Rapaho racetrack or something in Colorado, and um, we supported rodeo, we went to, like, the Elbert County Fair, um, the Kiowa Fairgrounds, stuff like that. We went to rodeos at um, in Elizabeth, Colorado. That was like, we, we lived close to there with my grandparents. And yeah, so I was super involved. And I managed to somehow train my horse to the point where he stopped bucking me off and rearing up and all of that. For the most part, although he kind of kept doing that stuff just more sporadically through the years, he was a lot more cantankerous than like my cousin's several horses that she went through. Um, but I mean, training a horse, they call it breaking them. And it's basically you just break them to the point where they know it's pointless to resist because they know they'll be punished and that if they don't do what you say right away, they'll be forced to or made to in a different way. And I talk to people through like comment sections all the time that are still riding horses and they're like, Psh, I can not force my horse to do anything. He's a 1200 pound animal. And it's like, yeah, you couldn't literally like pick up the horse like an object and force them to do something but training is basically just manipulation tactics to get them to do something by making the right thing like the quote right thing you want them to do easy on them and reward and then the wrong thing like resisting or rebelling or running away or bucking difficult by punishing them through doing something like lunging or making them work extra hard it's it's all just about control. Like, a lot of these horse people try and act like, oh, I have a bond with my horse. Like, I can get on my horse without any saddle and bridle and ride them around. And, and it's like, I did that too. I did that all the time. And I'm not even going to lie. It was fun. Like, we'd go down to the field. We'd stop the horse. We'd pet him. We'd jump on there. We'd grab their wither. We'd throw ourselves on there. And then we'd gallop up the hill back to the barn it was fun as hell um but that doesn't mean that we have some magical special bond it just means that the horse knows that if they were to buck us off along the way they would get like lunged or like hit with a whip as punishment you could easily just go you know you lived in colorado right you could have easily just gone to the ski slopes and pretty much got the same experience right yeah the thrill right yeah i mean i didn't have like ski trip kind of money but like horses aren't cheap I, I I mean my horse was free so basically it was just his feed that was and veterinary bills and yeah that's true kinds of stuff transporting yeah. them paying for gas for the car paying for the trailer paying the yeah fees I mean the... that all came later because I I couldn't get my horse in the trailer for a lot of years. And again, you'll hear more stories about those training efforts on the Under the Veg Fluence podcast. But. Yeah, so riding was a thrill. I mean, we used to go on the dirt road and gallop at full speeds. We'd let him run. And a lot of people say like, oh, horses like being ridden. Don't you see how much they love to run? Like, yeah, they want to run. They want to run the fuck away from you so that you stop riding them and forcing them to do competitions and these stupid things like turning barrels uh, just because they run when you let them. I mean, if you weren't on their back, if you didn't have all this stuff like bits in their mouths and tie downs and all this stuff, they would just run away from you. But I mean, they're in a pen for a reason. If you took away the fences, they would 
be gone. I mean, they might stick around if you're providing hay, but like they wouldn't just like follow you around and be like, please ride me. <laughs> no, they're only doing that because they were conditioned to do that. Yeah. And they know if they, it's, so basically this magical, like, oh, I have a connection with my horse that people talk about to try and justify it is just, all that is, is they're submissive because it's easier than fighting back because they know if they fight back, then it'll be a more long, drawn out process. They'll get lunged or punished in some way or worked or whatever. So anyway, my point was, you know, we'd run the horses on the dirt road and, like, allow them to go as fast as they wanted to to kind of get that adrenaline rush and that thrill because, like, you know, if you were to fall off at that speed, especially on some of these dirt roads, you would get really fucking hurt. And if the horse were to start bucking or, you know, slow down enough to start bucking, like, you're in a bad pickle and then they're running free around this neighborhood because it is a really is really out in the country and, and you you would be pretty screwed if that happened so there's kind of this thrill of like ooh that could happen but like i trust myself as a rider and i trust my horse that that won't happen and it's kind of like this adrenaline rush thing but it's just silly because you can get this same adrenaline rush. Like Keegan was trying to bring up skiing and snowboarding earlier. I lived in Colorado. I could have found some way to like do that. I could have like there were a lot of people at my school that did that every weekend. I could have tagged along with them to get that same like speed rush. That I could have gone and rode dirt bikes instead. I could have like rode BMX bicycles. I mean there's so many ways I could have been longboarding, I could have been skateboarding. There's just no reason or excuse on why we have to involve and use and exploit animals for entertainment or fun or or sport even. Like most sports don't involve exploiting an animal. I could have been doing some sort of sport. Like, I don't know, I could have even started having a car and ran it at Bandamere Speedway or borrowed cars and like rent rent them at the speedway like there's endless possibilities and it kind of just goes to show that the only reason that people do these things these things to animals is because they were taught to by their family tradition right yeah nobody just wakes up one day is like oh there's a horse there let me see how i can abuse them no it's a system of abuse it's it's your parents doing it and then it's them teaching you to do it yeah it's it's this false idea like that i was in this family where I had a very twisted idea of what love was and that was basically control and domination and like punishment. That's what I thought like love was because that's what I was receiving from the family. And again, you'll hear more about that on the Under the Vegfluence podcast. But um, eventually, you know, my cousin started first because like I said, I had problems training my horse to get in the trailer, but she started doing competitions. She would go to Jim Connors and she would also do a little bit of jumping, but it was mostly the barrel racing, and I wanted to do that so bad because I saw how much, you know, praise and attention and sense of accomplishment she got from that. And I, I mean, my family was telling me, oh, I, I can't do it, and you're too nice to the horse and stuff, and I, I wanted to do the shows, and eventually I did. And the, the thing about this is, The whole time it was about my ego, my proving to my family, my having fun, my entertainment, my sense of purpose in life, my sense of accomplishment. All about me, and it was never for my horse's best interest. You know, I thought I loved my horse, but really I just had a fucked up definition of what love was. I, it wasn't his best interest because the only way to actually legitimately love horses and look after them in a way that's for their best interests and not just exploiting them is to literally just give them their needs their food their water their medical care and to provide sanctuary especially not riding them yeah not riding at all there's not like it's not vegan to ride horses it's it's exploitation and um, if you ride them for more than like 10 minutes, you're hurting them. It's, they're not supposed to be ridden. 
Like, I know that we have a long history in humanity of writing them, but that was also long before we had cars and ATVs and all these other things that we could just use instead. So it's just kind of an outdated animal abusing tradition that I understand, like I of all people understand having an emotional attachment and connection to that, but there's still no excuse for it to continue to happen. It's not like my life is worse now that I stopped this involvement in horse riding. It's actually a lot better. I'm not missing anything. I just, I have, I feel happier. I feel like I sleep a lot better at night because I'm not hurting animals. So anyway, how did I go from that to being a vegan and animal rights activist? I mean, there's more details about this transition on the Under the Vegfluence episode, but basically I was doing the shows and I finally won, you know, my stupid buckle and then I realized how not actually important it was after I had it. And But I still went to college at Colorado State University for equine science, and I went there for three years, which included an internship for a semester in this horse breeding farm, and I witnessed a lot of cruelty and abuse there. And after that, I just, I lost the interest to ride horses, and I kind of realized, like, this was always my cousin's hobby, my cousin's passion. I wasn't even personally interested into it. I was just, I didn't know myself. I didn't really, I just wanted to prove my family wrong because they were like such mean people. And that was my main reason for getting involved. And so it wasn't even that hard for me to give up, even though I did have this emotional attachment and it was quote my passion. But yeah, I just lost interest after being at that internship because I witnessed a lot of death of horses and baby horses and I I didn't feel good about the breeding that I was participating in and I just I didn't see anything good about it anymore I kind of started to open my eyes and wake up and see it for what it actually was instead of romanticizing it because horse riding is pretty romanticized especially in the way that it's targeted to young girls and women it's very much more women and girls that are doing this sport which is ironic because there's actually more women and girls that are vegan and that are animal rights activists and that you know we we tend to have more compassion toward animals generally speaking so it's really interesting that we have like these rodeo movies and like Flicka and black beauty and all these like really false stories of like the girl meets the wild horse and they have a bond and the horse lets the girl ride and doesn't let other people ride and they save the ranch that almost had to be sold and like all these weird like romanticized things and you have all these toys that are like Barbies riding horses and briar horses and it was it's kind of brainwashed into not all girls but like certainly girls that live in certain areas and you have to wonder like why is that why is animal abusing so part of our culture especially like as Americans so so yeah I obviously grew up in an animal abusing family and I was taught and encouraged to abuse my horse and animals in general but I it it still was my responsibility to wake up one day and take responsibility for what I've done and face it and be like I've done a lot of really fucked up things I've done wrong I need to turn like a 180 and stop doing this. And there was a gap of time before I even went vegan between quitting the horse industry. But now that I am an animal rights activist and I speak up for animals, it just seems like I'm finally doing what's right. And I did a lot of what's wrong in the past. But, you know, you just kind of have to have compassion for yourself and understanding for the ways in which you used to uh, engage in animal abuse, even if it was just through the foods you ate and it wasn't as direct, you can still become a vegan, you can still become an animal rights activist, and you can still, like, not be ashamed and just use it as part of your story. And you can still get all the same thrills and joy. Exactly. In another way. In a more fulfilling, deep way. Yeah. Yeah, and for me, I mean, transitioning out of fishing was... 
I, you know, when I was, I think it was around 14 or 15, we kind of stopped going to Canada and fishing. So that kind of brought me away from it. Um, I did a little bit more fishing later on um, in Boston with a family friend. Um, but nowadays, I can give you an example. I mean, now I go to a mountain house up in the Adirondack Mountains with a bunch of college buddies. And some of them still fish. And I sure as hell don't. I actually, believe it or not, I actually sometimes get in, in my kayak and will make a ruckus in the water to try to scare away the fish Good. from my <laughs> friends fishing because that shit just doesn't fly around me. My friends know how passionate I am about this stuff. And I can say that I was a little bit, you know, less considerate when I first started, you know, when I first made the switch. But now I'm a little bit, you know, more tame and a little bit more educated about things and realizing that what this entire podcast is about. Everybody was an animal abuser at some time. Not everybody, I guess. There are probably some people that are born vegan. We know, yeah. and we know a few people, but I just know that every time I go to this mountain house now, I, you know, I sure as hell am never, ever going to fish again, ever. So there you go. We used to be animal abusers, especially me. I was a pretty hardcore animal abuser. Um, uh, my horse still exists and is alive, but unfortunately, before I quit the horse lifestyle, and it wasn't in my control, but my aunt actually removed him from my grandpa's house and literally just gave him away to people. And these people are now unfortunately doing what I used to do, the barrel racing and stuff. And since I never had a bill of sale or proof of ownership or a brand or anything, there was nothing I could do about it. So that's kind of something that I have to live with. Unfortunately, I cannot legally or practically remove my horse from that situation and put him on a sanctuary. But, oh my God, if I could, I would. And there's people all over the world who have horses and ride and then they realize and they have their eyes opened to the exploitation and they 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 just keep their horse and but then they just look after them instead of exploiting them and and that's possible like anything's possible any situation you're in you can veganize it and have a vegan lifestyle moving forward from that but anyway i think that wraps up this episode and yeah don't forget Veganuary, veganuary.com. It's linked in the show notes if you are not a vegan yet. It's so simple, so easy. It's free. They give you all the information you could possibly need starting vegan, what to eat, nutrition info, just anything you could ever need. Anything else to add, Keegan? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think she pretty much said it all, but just remember every single person out there listening, if you're not vegan... There's always hope for everybody. We never will ever lose hope for you. Uh, I used to be a little less hopeful in the beginning, but now I definitely am with how exponentially, how, how the exponential growth of the number of vegans in the world is just, it's inspiring. Um, yeah. And especially with all these different podcasts coming out, people, you know, talking about their past abuses. But yeah, I mean, check out Veganuary, check out Earthling Ed, and again, We'll link all the stuff in the show notes, but um, check out what a fish knows if you want to find out what a fish actually knows. Yeah, definitely. All right. Thank you, and have a beautiful day. Happy New Year. Until I was vegan.